So, following on from that, um, I'm delighted to introduce to you Brooke called Klesio. Uh, one of the things that we know that we have to do is to measure um, impact. And one of our, as Montessorians, we want to have impact. And we recognize that one of the ways that we can have impact is to work in the public or government school systems to the best that we can and to um, have an influence across all um, uh, uh, aspects of society giving accessibility to children. Now, it is important to know that those bring challenges, but it's equally important to know that we can meet those challenges for the children's sake. And so I'd like to introduce Brooke to you. Uh, she has done a number of large-scale um, evaluations on different types of school in public schools, but one of her uh, current interests is in looking at Montessori in the public school system, particularly uh, a study at the moment that she's been doing in South Carolina. These are the things that change policymakers. You, as you know, we can talk about the idea of Montessori until uh, individually to many people, and they can be convinced. But at the end of the day, if they're going to actually say this is something we will adopt, they have to have an understanding that it will make a difference. So I'm very happy to introduce Brooke to you. She has uh, a number of incredible academic uh, uh, qualifications, including two masters as well as her PhD. Um, Brooke is actually currently uh, attached to the Riley Institute at Furman University, and she has done the most comprehensive evaluation of Montessori in the public school system that has ever been done to date. So we are very privileged to have her. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here in Amsterdam and to be at my first AMI gathering. So thank you for having me. Um, I am honored um, and excited to be able to share with you um, after five years and then a, a planning year, five years of data collection, and then another year of analysis, the methodology and the findings from a very large scale study that we did in the state of South Carolina. And I want to give you a little bit of context about South Carolina before and, and Montessori before I jump into talking about the study. Um, South Carolina, for being a very, very small state um, in the United States, has the largest number of public Montessori programs in the United States. So even compared to a large state like California with a far greater population, um, we have the largest number of public programs in the state, in the country. And the reason that that happened is there was a foundation um, in the state that um, and I'm not exactly sure how the, the, what the beginnings were, but became interested in Montessori. We do have a lot of very quality private uh, Montessori in, in the state as well. Um, learned about Montessori, learned about the method, and wanted to, wanted to bring it to the public sector. That was between 20 and 25 years ago. Um, this foundation made a very large investment in putting Montessori in the public schools, and then, 20 years after that, decided that they wanted to see if their investment had paid off in terms of in our state, especially with our large uh, numbers of low-income and rural settings that we have in South Carolina, has the investment in Montessori education paid off in terms of uh, achievement, in terms of what we are seeing with our children? So that is why the Riley Institute was commissioned to do um, a study on Montessori in the public sector. I am not a Montessorian. I am a researcher that has been involved in education research my entire career and in teaching, but I am not a Montessorian, and I think that was by design that they wanted somebody that was outside of Montessori to come in and learn and study and report. So that was by design. But as I will talk about, as I, I talk about the different pieces of the study, because I'm not a Montessorian, 
I did have to bring in several people from the Montessori community to help design the study, to help design instruments or select appropriate instruments. So it, it was a team effort in that uh, regard. So just a little bit of a, a background on South Carolina so you can understand the context. The National Center for Montessori in the Public Sector does a great job of tracking the, the program, so I do encourage you to look at their site to see, um, that, to, to see how Montessori is really growing um, across, definitely across the United States. So what I'm going to do for the rest of this presentation, and Steve, do you have a stop time? I know we're pushed back a little bit. Okay. Um, what I'm going to try to do is just give you a quick introduction to what we did in our study. Um, also, the different pieces and the methodology. Also, to give you an overview of the study findings for all of the different facets of the study. Um, then to kind of wrap everything up and give some concluding statements. And then we probably won't do Q&A during my presentation, but there will be a panel after where we can have uh, some discussion. And I've, I've touched on most of this slide. Um, I did want to, uh, again, recognize the Cell Family Foundation that is my funder, um, and to also emphasize that this study is in the public sector, and the goal being to really fill, fill the gap and to, to look at investment. So this being a very comprehensive study, we, we needed to look at everything from fidelity to the model all the way down to impact and perceptions. So we really designed a, a four-pronged study where we started off with looking at Montessori as a model. You know, we could say that in South Carolina there are, you know, 100 programs across the state that's in, that are implementing Montessori. But are they really implementing Montessori? How, how do we know? So that was a very critical piece of the study, was to do some analysis, to go into some classrooms and see, are, is Montessori being implemented with um, what, whatever or some level of authenticity? And it was important to be able to establish that before we even began to look at outcomes. So that was a, a critical first prong of the study. The second was exploring academic and behavioral outcomes. I know that there is definitely divergence in opinion on um, doing this in terms of standardized test, um, but that was something that our decision, decision makers in South Carolina and, and I think would be a common situation that those uh, outcomes be looked at, so that was a part of our study. But we also looked at the behavioral outcomes that we were seeing from our students. So I will talk about those a little bit more, too. And then the third prong, and this is a prong we actually had to sell to our funder, because they weren't really interested in the non-academic outcomes. They were interested in the behavioral, the academic and the behavioral, but when we started talking about, well, are, are these standardized tests measuring you know, everything that we, we want to look at? We had to kind of sell it to them, but we finally did, and they, they did give us a little more funding for this third prong of the study, which was just exploring the effective or non-academic outcomes. That's where, which I think is really nice that I'm, I'm speaking after Phil, where we delved into more of you know, the executive function, we delved into creativity, and social skills and work habits. So I'll talk about that a little bit more later, too. But again, we did have to kind of sell that because that wasn't something that um, you know, was originally um, an intent of the study. And then the last prong was we really wanted to get at teacher perceptions. In South Carolina, as I know many, it's a, a problem across the United States, is teacher attrition. Um, you know, large numbers of teachers leaving the teaching profession, low uh, job satisfaction. We're not seeing that as much in Montessori in South Carolina in the public schools. We're seeing teachers staying in their jobs, um, showing higher levels of satisfaction. We wanted to, to, to delve into that a little bit more. So we did do some teacher surveying for two um, years of the study. So that's kind of a big picture of what we did over the five years of the study looking at fidelity, 
looking at outcomes and several different measures, and then looking at some perceptions as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through some of the results that uh, we found. So looking at fidelity, um, we had a kind of a two-pronged approach to this, and that was we did a implementation survey that looked at really just the essentials of, of Montessori as defined by the essentials document that I know AMI, AMS, and other organizations have endorsed, and really just asking simple questions about, you know, multi-aged groupings, about uh, the uh, materials in the classroom that administrators would answer. But we knew we wanted to delve in a little bit more, uh, so we did visit every single program across the state and observed um, 126 classrooms, randomly selected, unannounced observations. So we were really able to see what was going on in the classroom, and that was critical. So there was, it's a, it was a lengthy process and also a lengthy process to score. And you will see up here the score essentially was based on the prepared environment, classroom climate, student learning, instruction, lesson planning, record keeping, and student assessment. And that was actually ascertained after a 30-minute interview with the teacher after the observation. So it's a very in-depth process. And a, a, another goal of this part of the study, too, was not just to um, come up with a fidelity score or to knock somebody out of the study because they didn't meet a threshold, but was also to be able to get valuable information that we could take back to schools about implementation. So this is what we found. And I will say that at the beginning of this study, and this is, was not something that we wanted to find, but there were schools that were calling themselves Montessori schools that were not implementing Montessori in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> Seriously. And we, um, you know, we would call, can you return this survey? As uh, the researchers in the room know, it's a lot of work to sometimes get people to respond or to, so we would call and say, you haven't returned your survey. And finally, they're like, well, we're, we're taking a break this year. <laughs> and we were like, okay, you're out. <laughs> um, so there were those programs that are not even included in this number because those were not Montessori schools. And of course, we, we have a State Department of Education that does track programs. Parents call, they want to find out where Montessori programs are, so we would report back to them. So they, you know, they, they can't be marketing their schools as Montessori schools when they're not implementing Montessori. So anyway, pushing them out, these are the results that we got for the schools that were at least implementing Montessori to some degree. Most of the, the programs did well. There were, there were issues. And again, I wish our, Montessori, our Montessorian was here to really talk you through. That's a, that's a whole other presentation. Um, and, and we are doing these across the state so we can bring back the information uh, to schools. So most of our programs did fall in high fidelity. There were several, 14 in mid fidelity, and there were, there were also um, you know, many in the low fidelity as well. So that was you know, good just to kind of get a, get a grip on implementation across the state. That was important. Um, we did include sc all schools in the analysis. You know, the research question was not the, the impact of, Montes of high fidelity Montessori on outcomes. The research question was, what is the impact of Montessori in South Carolina as it is being implemented on uh, outcomes? So that, that's important. Looking, uh, stratifying it by fidelity level is another very, very good question that we would like to get to um, in, in future years, and we will, but, but for this project, it was not. So moving on then, and I'm sorry I'm going so fast, but I want to get to everything. Um, moving on to outcomes. So really quick, I wanted to give you a demographic look at uh, our Montessori students in South Carolina. That's a good framing for talking about outcomes. So as you can see, we have around 7,500 students. Um, our study began in 2013, 
and ended in 16, and you can see the, the trajectory of growth. And, and even since this, we are well over 8,500. Now it is, we have seen several more programs uh, to open, and which is nice because as you will see from this slide, as you would expect in the early, earlier years, we have more programs, but as students get older, the number of programs drop off. They may have you know, a primary program and a lower elementary, you know, but as they get into the middle school years, um, there are far fewer uh, public programs. So some of the schools that we are seeing open in South Carolina are those that students have gone through, parents have been pleased, and then they're like, well, we can't stop now. So that's a really positive thing. So this is a breakdown of demographics of our students, which is important not just to see, okay, what do our Montessori students look like, but for the design of our study was very important because we want to make sure when we are looking at outcomes that we are really comparing apples to apples in terms of our students demographically. So we needed to do an assessment of this and then be able to control and to um, adjust as we um, analyze for impact and outcomes. So as you can see from a glance, our Montessori students and our non-Montessori traditional students look fairly similar. It's not, and because in the United States, I know, and maybe around the world, Montessori sometimes is seen as it's an elite approach to education. Well, this show, shows a different story here. When you look at the percentage of low income, you look at um, the, the racial breakdown, student, the Montessori and non-Montessori students look very, very similar. You know, with 54% with, uh, of the Montessori students in South Carolina are low income. I mean, that is definitely telling a different story from maybe the expectation. However, there is still a difference. And statistically, even for low income, for example, when you see the 54% and the 63% of non-Montessori being, uh, non being low income, that we know we, we want to make that equal when we do any comparisons. So even though generally the populations are looking somewhat similar, they're still different enough that we need to adjust before we make any comparisons. So that leads me into talking about outcomes. Now that we've established some level of fidelity in the schools, we've looked demographically to see, okay, what, are, what do our students look like so we know that you know, when we're looking at outcomes that we are making fair comparisons. So then moving into to the um, analysis of outcomes, there are several things as researchers that we're concerned about. And I, I will take a moment to back up. I think most of you all heard Dr. Lillard's presentation on Friday. And she talked about a very well done, large study of uh, Montessori as well. What she was fortunate to be able to do was a randomized controlled trial where the randomization helped alleviate any concerns of selection bias or anything else that you may be concerned about when you're trying to do these kinds of comparisons. Randomized control trial done correctly control for that and allow you to have kind of equivalent populations. So we did not have that situation. Um, as, as you all can imagine as practitioners or as researchers doing that kind of research, is really, really hard and, and is fraught with, with a lot of issues when you start talking about assigning to control groups and then to, you know, if you're the parent of the control child, I mean, I'm a parent of three children. I, I don't know, I, even as a researcher, I think I would be like, well, I, I don't want my child to be in the control. Uh, I want them to be in the treatment, if it's Montessori. <laughs> or maybe in other things, not in the treatment, if it's a, a different model. Um, so what we did was what we call a quasi-experimental design. So we did not have randomization, but what the quasi-experimental design does is try to make it 
replicate randomization or at least to, to make your, your um, control and treatment samples equivalent to, to do the, the best you can. So gratefully, we have a very, very talented statistician and we're dividing and conquering. He's in New York City right now at the um, American Education Research Association meeting presenting on this study as well. Um, he can really talk about the nitty gritty of the statistics and the matching procedure, but um, I'll spare you that. <laughs> um, but, but what we did in a, in a nutshell was, you know, we had a large database of every student in the state of South Carolina, and we were able to look at several variables poverty status, prior test scores, special education status, and really do a, as close of a matching procedure as possible so students were being compared fairly. So what we did is we compared achievement growth. Again, that was a way to, um, to, to control for some of the issues with this type of design of Montessori to non-Montessori students over several years. Little water break. So what we found when we looked, this is standardized test scores. I know, don't holler at me for that, but it is, um, we have a large database. That it is an ease also of using data that are already there for that large of, um, of a database. So interesting, because when you look at these scores, math, ELA, writing, science, and social studies. You may think because, and I was concerned a little bit, that these tests where, you know, if, if you're doing Montessori properly, you're not prepping them for the test. You're not drilling your math facts. You're not doing those types of things that we know, I know, because my, my children are there right now that they are getting to prep for these tests. So you would think they're not getting that. But then when you look at the results here, and I'll tell you how to interpret this, we have these blocks. If there is a green block with Mont in it, it means Montessori students outperform non-Montessori students statistically significantly. Again, comparing those two matched groups. If you have a blank box, it means there, somebody did better than the other, but there was no statistically significant difference. And if you see the red block, it means a non-Montessori students outperformed the Montessori students in a statistically significant fashion. The weird block at the bottom means South Carolina ran out of money and they had to eliminate something and they eliminated the writing test. So that's what that means. Pretty powerful, pretty powerful. Um, I, even more powerful is this slide. So this is looking at scores by subgroups. So when you look at overall is what you just saw. And this is looking at growth from the beginning to, to the, the first year of the study to the last year of the study. And if you look at the first column, or excuse me, row, you will look at low income and you will see that in, three, in ELA and math and social studies are low income, and again, we are looking as compared to other demographically similar low income traditional students, that those students are doing better, statistically significantly on these tests. And if you go down, I mean, you can see white students seem to be benefiting the most if you're technically looking at it, but you look at our other subgroups of students there are Hispanic students that the sample size was very low there, so there was hard to get any kind of statistical significance. But I think the, um, the green tells the story. Then we also, like I said, we went beyond looking at the academic, the standardized test, and looked at behavioral outcomes. This same database that I talked about, we track um, discipline incidences, behavioral referrals, ISS, OSS, in-school suspension, out-of-school suspension, expulsions. And if you look again, it's the same red block, green block, white block. And then, of course, some years we had no data. So you can see also, in terms of behavioral outcomes, 
that our Montessori students are doing far better. And obviously the green block means better, as in they had fewer incidences, and it's not that green means they had higher. So this just means what you would want as an educator. And then, the most interesting part of the study, I think, is looking at the effective outcomes. And again, this is where um, what Phil talked about earlier, I think, is very useful. Uh, we looked at executive function, social skills and work habits, and creativity. Now, I will say back in 2011 or 12, I think it was, when we were beginning to look at instruments to measure these constructs, that's when, thank God, I had Steve Hughes who I gratefully met and was able to pick his brain about different assessments to use, and it was extraordinarily helpful um, because there, there, there was so much out there, but then there wasn't in terms of validated you know, quality instruments. So I'll talk about executive function first. And wow, I wish the MEFs had been around in 2012 because we, didn't have, um, we did not have a instrument like that to measure executive, executive function. And so we had to use what was out there, which was a good assessment, the head, shoulders, knees, toes, um, but not, not what we have now. And I will back up to say we obviously did not administer this, these assessments to all 7,500 Montessori students. We had a, a, a smaller sample of 100 Montessori and 100 control students. In a, in a high quality Montessori school, high fidelity, and did those comparisons. We started when students were approximately uh, four years old and then followed them for four years. So we administered the assessments each year to the same group of students. So with executive function, the, the middle two years, we, we use the National Institutes of Health Toolbox, which was a good measure. Phil, you will appreciate that we used an earlier version of it where we had to drag the computers into the schools, which was really hard. So it was very nice when the iPad-based assessments became available that weren't quite as laborious. Um, and we did use the MEFs in the last year of the, of the study. So we did, we found over the years, um, we found some mixed results, but um, a small advantage in some years for Montessori. Those were researcher-administered assessments. Um, and then let me jump down to creativity because that's another researcher-based assessment that we did. We used the EPOC. Has anybody ever used the EPOC in this room? You have, okay. So it's, pretty, it's, a, it's a good instrument, but it's, it's, it's lengthy and um, the scoring process is, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. But we did find we administered this assessment to our Montessori students and to our control students, and um, we did see a statistically significant advantage for Montessori students. And then lastly, we, we looked at social skills and work habits. These were not admin, uh, researcher-administered assessments, um, but were um, inventories that teachers would complete um, and you know, thus maybe not as, as the data I don't think were, were, were quite as usable because of that uh, in terms of comparing your raters are different. And, um, but we, we saw some mixed results. We saw Montessori students doing better in a lot of areas and no differences in others and some non-Montessori students doing better. So we had a little bit of a mixed result there. All in all, I'm glad that we were able to explore these non-academic outcomes in a study like this, because as we all know in this room, it's important. As a researcher, I'm really glad to see the progress in terms of instruments to measure these uh, types of constructs. It's really hard, and it's hard to do right. And I always try to say that when I talk about these results, because I feel like we're still getting there. Um, but I'm, I'm grateful for the work that's taken place the last five years to, to get us to where we are. And I think usable for researchers like me, but also for practitioners to use in the classroom for students. So quickly, let me um, talk about the teacher survey, which was so fascinating. We had something like a 78% response rate one year, and then maybe like a 79% response rate the next year, which is phenomenal. Our Montessori teachers were very excited to be a part of this study. Um, I think the, the, the 
this is not surprising to you all in this room, but as a researcher looking to see the number of Montessori teachers being not just liking their jobs, but loving their jobs. Um, in South Carolina, you don't hear that. Um, in, in the news, you, all you hear about is low teacher salaries and teacher shortages and uh, teacher strikes across, not in South Carolina, but across the country. So to see this is you know, pretty amazing. Positively and negatively, very few want to become administrators. So great, our teachers are not leaving the classroom, but the leadership gap, you know, we, we are seeing issues with, you know, somebody leading, because there's nobody else to choose from, a Montessori school not having really a clue about what Montessori is. So there's that. Um, majority reported public Montessori has the potential to grow in South Carolina. Very positive. Negative. Concerns about the authenticity and fidelity to the model because of the constraints that they have in the public sector. You know, you have to test prep. Why are you not test prepping? They have to go to the honor roll ceremony. Um, they have to go to PE. You know, those types of things that make it hard, especially if a principal doesn't understand. They're not being, maybe being an advocate for you and your school um, at a higher level to make it where you can do what you need to do and what you were trained to do as a Montessori teacher. Um, many express a need for more support from administration and district and more professional development. I think that goes along with everything else I was saying. And this was the biggest and probably not a surprise uh, to anybody who's had to deal with the accountability movement in the United States. Many express concerns about pressure of a standards-based curriculum and amount of time spent testing students. Um, it really is out of control. So that's it. Um, the, the study as, as a whole provides considerable evidence of a Montessori advantage. Policymakers in our state have taken note of this. Um, I, there's, there's a lot of interest. Um, this provides, I think, when you look at the subgroup analysis, the evidence of the egalitarian possibilities of Montessori. I mean, look at how our low-income students did. They seem to benefit. The low-income uh, and low-achieving students are benefiting from Montessori um, along with other subgroups. There are lots of limitations to our study, the biggest being it's not randomized. Uh, it's not a randomized controlled trial. We're using standardized tests. There's lots of limitations, but the bottom line is this is a piece of the puzzle. A lot more research needs to be done. Gratefully, with the IES study that Dr. Lillard referenced, hopefully that will come through. The Brady Foundation has um, funded a study coming up. We're going to have more. So this is a small piece of a big research puzzle that needs to take place. Thank you. found that very enlightening and encouraging. Thank you so much. Let us realize that we just have to face the hard things and get on and do them, and do them to the very best of our ability, because we would like people like Brooke to be able to find as many clues in, and keys for us to know how to do that work better because that's what you're really helping us to do. So thank you so thank much you. for that. That is a small gift for you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you so I much. I appreciate it's, it. And you, and, thank you. you know, thank you so much. It just, it just is in, incredible that we're able to um, begin now to look at these kinds of, of uh, objective, huge-scale experiences and understand that you know, until we face these things and until we then start to see what... what lies behind the difficulty and how we can actually begin to think our way through to, to bring about that fidelity so that the children are receiving what they need, to bring about the policy makers so that they can understand that it's not uh, a trivial thing. I know that um, when we first thought about Montessori for the uh, population in, in Kenya, the IDP population, there was some level of uh, disbelief that we could actually have something that was in, at all relevant to their experiences. And these sort of things help us to show that actually it is relevant to all children. And if we're really robust about it, in all settings. So thank you so much for that.